the queen was born the queen and I was not. And we are all humans having this human experience and we don't get a choice in where we are born and how we are born into what families we're born. And I keep coming back to this, that it must be an inherent birthright of ours to take back control over the life that we want. Our ever-changing world calls upon the most courageous, resilient, and relentless of us to face its most extraordinary challenges. To help you embark on this journey, we present the Impactful Coaching Podcast, your oasis for inspiration and a beacon to spark the fires of greatness within you. I'm Joseph. I will be your ally in this journey to empower your potential. Join us each week as we dive deep into the heart of ambition, drive, and success to unravel compelling stories of daring leaders who dreamed, struggled, and achieved victory. Our journey begins now. How is everybody doing? This is the Impactful Coaching Podcast, and my name is Joseph. If this is the first time that you've joined us, I'm a web media guy. I've been web media for 10 years, and what I do is I help people understand and use web media to the best of their ability. So if you want to find me on LinkedIn, feel free, Joseph Ianni. Uh, don't find the other Joseph Ianni, the one that's a poet, although he's a cool guy. I actually managed to meet him. I am here today with uh, Danny Wallace, hashtag I am the queen uk. Danny, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? I'm really good. Do you know what? You're the last conversation I get to have on the day that we're recording this, and I've been really looking forward to it. Our stars have been a little bit crossed until today, so I feel like I feel like I'm just really excited to speak to you, Josie. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here on the program. I I can only begin to quantify how valuable your time is, and so I'm going to do everything I can to make this conversation worth everybody's while. I I learned this lesson the physically painful way, which is if you're not totally sure what part of the UK someone is from, don't take a shot in the dark. Uh, so whereabouts <laughs> from the UK are you from exactly? Well, I'm exactly from Preston, which is in the northwest of England, but it's mm -hmm. easier for m more people in the world to understand Manchester, which is sort of the, the capital of the north, although Liverpool would argue. Uh, but yeah, I'm in the northwest of England. See, I, I sort of have that same thing come up um, because I'm Italian on both sides. And so whenever somebody asks me where, what parts of Italy are my parents from, I'm like, oh, no, not this again. Uh, my dad is from Sora. Where's that? It's a village. Okay. It was not everybody's from Rome. So, and then my mom, I forget. So I just say she's Calabres and everybody says, oh yeah, that checks out. I'm like, oh, does it? Well, that's good news. Oh, good. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I guess the other thing that I'd like to ask before I start going with, you know, the prepared material is, so this is the last call of the day. I was just, how many calls did you have today? So today, it was a really mixed bag today, actually, Joseph. So a typical day in the office, I'm really lucky, it looks really varied. So even though I'm in, I'm in my office, this morning I was uh, doing a feedback session with a client for an event that they did. So they sent me some video footage for an event that they did and wanted some breakdown on how they can tighten up the nuts and bolts of their talk. I've had a couple of conversations with new clients or people that are wanting to work with me and seeing if we're a great fit and onboarding those. Um, there's been difficult conversations that I've had today. So we've had a videography team that we've been working with for a long, long while, and we're about to move into TV production for something that I'm working on. And it means that we have to work exclusively with the TV production team and not the videography team. So we've had sort of awkward and onward conversations today, really gentle and kind conversations about, you know, how can we work together in the future, but it's like, a no, not right now. So navigating lots of different types of conversations today. Well, you've managed to uh, keep up the, the energy uh, quite through all of that. Energy is something that I wanted to learn a little bit more about because one of the things that I, I attempt to do, I'm not saying I always do it, but one thing I, I attempt to do is try to sort of mirror or, or mimic the other person's energy. Um, my, my girlfriend, Jen, she said she actually really appreciated that when we first started talking. She said, well, when I would send you a message, you didn't like write less than what I wrote, but you didn't write more than what I wrote. You wrote about the same amount. So that's something that I, I have been told Italians do naturally is that we're very good at mirroring energy. But yeah. I, I wanted to... Uh, ask you like how do you how do you how do you keep it up does it come to you naturally are you like loaded up on caffeine do you have a, a secret <laughs> sauce like how does do, where does it come from um it might sound really glib when i say this but every single day i look out onto my work and i can see how important it is for the people that i work with and the change that i want to see in the world and i'm genuinely grateful to be able to get to do what i do like it's where we're, we're filming this on a tuesday right we're recording this on a tuesday and many people, Monday and a Tuesday, especially at the top end of winter, are starting to feel things. They're starting to, you know, their, their legs are starting to drag a little bit. 
um, you know, they'll get that Monday morning feeling, oh, I've got to do this for work today is the inherent feeling. Oh, God, here's what I've got to do today. And I don't get that feeling. I get that. I look what I get to do. The the premise of the business that I have, being in, in public speaking, being in performance and, and helping people do that helps people go out and share their message. Like no one's in business because they inherently don't want to help people. They want to help people. And I get to help people help people, which mm -hmm. really sits within my core value set. And considering sort of 13, 14 years ago, I had absolutely nothing. In fact, I'd lost everything. The very fact that I get to choose what I do, choose who I work with, choose the events that I speak at, create events myself, I just pinch myself. So the very fact that I'm here talking to you, this is work. This is ridiculous. How mm -hmm. Look what I get to do. I get to speak to you at this time after having some brilliant conversations today. How can I not have energy for that? You know, it's, it seems for me remiss of me to not bring my whole self to everything that I do because I'm so grateful for it. Well, I think just about the trouble with the point of view people have about Mondays isn't that isn't necessarily a Monday's fault. It just it so happens to be yeah, the first Monday. day in a string of five <laughs> that all come across as basically the same day. And then Saturday and Sunday are, are two very different days. And that's been the conventional set up this conventional formula for a good chunk of the world's pop the civilized world's population. Yeah. So, uh, but as I was working on my on my novel, it's a fantasy novel. And when you write fantasy, you can basically can change anything you want. And so, one of the things that I change is the days of the week. And then I, it occurred to me that I'm actually starting to impart some of this into my own reality. So instead of Monday, in my mind, I call it morn day because it's the the morning of the week. It's the dawn of the week, and it's the opportunity to establish habits and routines that could. In the same way that a good morning can make a good day, a good Monday can make a good week. And then Tuesday becomes toils day and it's the mentality of, okay, this is the day where I am working from like sun up to sun down. Yeah. And if I if I don't do anything fun, it's okay because that's the day. And then I just, and each day has a different personality. And I found like, sure, some days are more relaxing than others, but when every day can actually have a unique identity, I think it takes away some of that malaise that people have at the beginning of a week. That's really interesting. And actually, when you say it like that, subconsciously, that's something that I do already. So I get excited on a Monday. I'm really excited. I have all my team meetings stacked out on a, a Monday. We get fired up for the week. We look at what we've got to look forward to, what's going to move the needle. And then Tuesday is always the work day. That's the day that we're going to get stuff done. I'm going to, you know, make sure I've ticked off all the admin stuff because by the time it kind of gets to Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, I'm in the flow of things. Then Thursday, I'm looking forward to Friday. And then Friday is a bit of a party day mm -hmm. um, in terms of work and, and the work that I get scheduled in on a Friday. And I try and I try and keep Saturday and Sunday quite sacred, but being a performer, being a speaker means that sometimes I have to travel, means that sometimes that, you know, have gigs or whatever. So there's always sort of work stitched through, but again, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like a chore because each day has a different kind of feeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I just I, I don't want the audience to feel like I'm like um, I'm, I'm teasing it out by not saying what the other days are. So um, with, with Wednesday, I've actually it's a, it's the biggest change. I've started calling it Groves Day, and it's because it's the center of the week for me. It's the day where you have to kind of center yourself, and you're doing work, but you're trying to do work that's more personal and making sure that everything is good. Um, I converted Thursday to Thorns Day, which is the most confrontational day. If you got to get any shit out of the way, if there's fights you have to have, if you have to confront somebody on something, do it on Thorns Day because you don't want to yes. deal with it on, on Friday, which is Friar's Day. Get it day. all out of the yeah. way, ready for, yes. Yeah. So, that, and that's that's just sort of the fun of like, sure, it, it, it's fantasy, but fantasy is designed to mirror reality in ways that we don't necessarily initially think of, but the idea of actually taking it and be making it real is something that I'm happy to share with people. So, and it's not, and it's not like I've completely pulled it out of thin air, right? As you've been describing to me, it it's in line with the way we approach different days. So, yeah. And hang on, wait, we've not done Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. What have we got? Friday is Friars Day. I mean, that's you know, it's the day for your friends. Um, Saturday is well, in in the novel, it's there's a different word for stars, but it's basically Star Day, which is like yeah. the day where you do what you're you aspire most to do because this okay. is the day they truly have to yourself and then sunday is already perfect right it's it's the day that. of the sun it's the day of gratitude and of reflection and rest 
it's funny that you call Friday Friars Day because here in the UK, on a <laughs> we have a, a a tradition of fish and chips, right? So mm -hmm. fish and chips is is something that you know it's a bit of a staple here. We've got fish and chip shops, and you get battered fish and chips. Um, but on a Friday, it's it's quite traditional to have you know uh, fish and chips on a Friday. Have fish on a Friday, and uh, so that's what they call day. the fish and chips. Fry, well, yeah. yeah, essentially. But but a friary is uh, an old name for a fish and chip shop. Oh, okay. <laughs> So with that, and believe me, we can go, um, we can spend the entire hour just um, uh, uh, going through this. I, uh, of that time, sure. Uh, but I do got some work to do. So we do. to the audience, I, you've answered this question a hundred thousand times. This is going to be a hundred thousand and one, but would you care to let the audience know, you know, what you do, what you're up to and what stake do you have in the coaching world? Absolutely. So for those of us that haven't met before, I am Danny Wallace and I am the Queen Bee, which is a ridiculously audacious statement to make, you know, entering into rooms and declaring myself royalty certainly rubs people up the wrong way. But as soon as they realize in the next breath, when I when I explain that, it starts to make sense. So I'm a public speaking coach. Essentially, that's my muggle job, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's my job that I do day on day helping people, particularly those from marginalized communities, marginalized backgrounds, marginalized socioeconomic backgrounds, take up space, particularly in the business world. So one of the things that I was annoyed about, I guess, I grew up on the council estates of Preston, which is essentially like the projects if, if you're in America. So the, a, poor, a relatively poor area. And people like us, people like me, didn't go on to create big, beautiful businesses or we certainly didn't go on to become performers or work on stage or or work in that kind of, in, in the online world. It just didn't happen. It wasn't something that was the done thing. It was very much expected that we would get a proper job in inverted mm -hmm. commas. And that kind of spilled out. I, I found that, you know, the queen was born the queen and I was not. And we are all humans having this human experience and we don't get a choice in where we are born and how we are born into what families we're born. And I keep coming back to this, that it must be an inherent birthright of ours to take back control over the life that we want, to be tenacious. Some of us have to be more tenacious than others. Some of us have more work to do because of where it is that we're born. But it is indeed our birthright to have success and health and good relationships and to take up space in the world in authenticity and so when I declare myself, I'm the queen bee, it's a reclamation statement. And if somebody from, you know, who's relatively scrappy and cheeky and, and, and from that particular background can walk into a room and declare themselves royalty, then potentially, maybe, just maybe, it'll inspire other people to do the same. So I am the queen bee comes from that. And the phrase I am the queen bee comes from that. So I've got two hats that I wear. One hat is the public speaking, motivational speaking, performance side of things. I do it and I teach it and I coach it. And then the other hat that I have were, is um, the Fly Anyway Foundation. So I have a foundation that helps people who've experienced domestic abuse build businesses. And the creation of my coaching business and the success that I've created from my coaching business has enabled me to do the philanthropic work that I know that I'm kind of here to do. So the MO of IATQB, I am the Queen Bee, is to create safe spaces to have conversations that matter, to, to create stages where people who would maybe not necessarily take up space, take up space, they get to see themselves or people like them on the stages and then aspire to and work towards doing that for themselves if that's something that they want to do, if they've got a mission or you know a business that they wanna share closed mouths don't get fed if you're not speaking mm -hmm. about those things then nobody's going to know about them so i help people to tap into that part of themselves because glossophobia the fear of public speaking is the number one fear in the western world joseph and i didn't realize this until i started sort of researching and building out what it was that i wanted to teach and i found that profoundly strange given that i've been a performer since i was seven so it came kind of naturally to me so yeah, in, in the in the coaching industry, I work specifically on speaking and the mindset centered around it and construction and all of that sort of stuff. And that has enabled me then to do the giving back work that uh, I always wanted to do with the Fly Anyway Foundation. Now, I'm a pretty big Harry Potter fan. And so when I hear you use the term muggle job, it, it I, I appreciate <laughs> how, you know, the Harry Potter series has expanded beyond the the books and has become a part of modern parlance and that's mm -hmm. something that i think every writer aspires to for one of their creations like what i was talking about with the days of the week for their creations to actually 
become part of reality. The question comes in two parts, but the first part is more just like the the, the warm up question, which is from your in your part of the world, how much is Harry Potter part of like day to day rhetoric? A huge amount, obviously. Um, the writer of the Harry Potter series is is from the UK, and it was very you know the UK when it was at its height is very proud that it kind of sprouted from here. You know, there's the big Harry Potter studios, and there's all the franchise stuff that has come and the merchandise that comes off the back of it, and even though it's it, it, phrases from it. it's like the verb to google something now is just yeah. a verb it's something that we do we don't go and search it we go and google it um having a muggle job or having that as part of the vernacular around here is is just kind of inherent like what ha- what house would you would you be from and people inherently know what a gryffindor is or a hufflepuff or a ravenclaw mm-hmm. or a slytherin and if you would say you were a slytherin it would be common for people to go oh <laughs> you know <laughs> are, you, are you really and and for people to really understand that and they might not have necessarily even read the books you know they they but they still understand the concept of being a muggle is is my day-to-day job is my human job instead of my magical job although it does get to be magical mm-hmm. I, and i i take it but i i need to ask just f- um for posterity but i take it that you read the harry potter series yeah okay <laughs> yeah i read the harry potter series just after they first came out i was really young at the time maybe maybe 15 14 15 and I found it strange that I saw these grown-ups reading these kids' books, but then obviously because the stories are so well written, mm-hmm. um, and then I was so excited when the films came out. The films were so well made. It's very rare, I think, that you get a film that creates what you see in your mind when you read the book. And I think they did the, the films they did particularly beautifully. I agree with that. I think between uh, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings are the two films that come to mind that. Well, obviously they they can't get everything because you're talking about two different mediums. There was enough respect and admiration for the source material that they brought it to life in a meaningful way. Now, all all of these questions, I just I, I'm asking them first because I didn't want to jump into assumptions. But one of the things that I know you've talked about on other um, programs, I listened to the Curious Entrepreneur podcast, is mm-hmm. that you do have a, a past with uh, domestic abuse. But a connection that I made in my mind was that so did Harry Potter. Um, he was a survivor of domestic abuse for of ten years, and then in his story, he you know he enters a new world where people love and care for him. And I was wondering if there was a parallel for that in your world, where you sort of exited one world and entered a new one that welcomed you and embraced you more. That's really interesting. I think there are definitely parallels there. And one of the things that I found that in order so when I was growing up, I experienced familial domestic abuse so it, you, uh, what have I, I experienced of my parents and my grandmas and granddads and aunties and uncles and and cousins domestic abuse and addiction particularly were, were things that were just inherent that was the information that I was given about relationships when I was very young and one of the things that I found was much like magic with Harry I guess that performing for me kept me safe and kept everybody around me safe so if I was singing, nobody was fighting. If I was performing and being funny and all eyes were on me, their eyes weren't on each other and they weren't fighting. So a lot of my early perform I didn't realize this until I started to do, you know, therapeutic work and you know and actually we do when we start to peel back layers. We, we we see ourselves in a little bit of a more a, a clear way. I didn't realize that my performance skills were centered in a trauma response at the time and then to come to grips with that and then start to use it for good was the direction that I wanted to take it down. So when I was sort of 16, 17, 18, started having sort of more meaningful relationships, intimate partner relationships, the information that I had dictated at the time, I didn't have any more information about how I should be treated. And that really played itself out. So eventually I found myself in a position where I was homeless with my two children underneath. uh, They were under the age of three at the time. And we were sofa surfing. I remember having this moment, Joseph, where we'd just got through the other side of that. We were in a, in a house that was safe and I got a job and it was okay. Um, and I was watching the B movie with my kids. And this this film from 2007. And there's this phrase that aerodynamically bees shouldn't be able to fly. Their little wings shouldn't get their fat little bodies off the ground. And their bees don't care what humans think is impossible. The bee flies anyway. 
and I clutched my pearls because I was like, that's me. I'm. I, that's what I want to do. I want to fly anyway. All decisions that I've made up to this point have been decisions and I had to take responsibility. And that's not me victim blaming myself. That's just me coming to terms with the fact that I was complicit in my direction so far. And the empowering thought was that I'm going to be complicit in the decisions that I make going forward. So it was really in that moment that I decided that there was something bigger than I and there was something else that I wanted to explore and wasn't sure what that was knew it centered around performance so I'd worked in corporate and I'd been um a learning development consultant I'd worked for some fantastic brands Jaguar Land Rover the car for warehouse Best Buy for, for a number of years and then took everything that I thought about performance and everything that I knew about learning and development thought Do you know what I could do more good with this. So it wasn't really creating uh, like a, another world to escape where I was from. It was looking to see what I could do with the light that I had in the world where I saw so much unjustness happening, particularly in the business space. There's so little for at the time, it was women. And then the more I explored it, it was other marginalized genders. It was people from the black community, Hispanic community, from the Asian community. There's so many more limited situations for people from marginalized communities to take up space. And that's when the, that's when I started to build a community. That's when I started to say, do you know what? Come here, let's have a conversation. Like what's going on for you? Help me understand your lived experience. In fact, let me help you help other people understand your lived experience. And from there, the hive, as it is known, uh, started to grow. And and now, yeah, it is it is a beautiful space where, you know, I'm welcomed and, and loved. I don't know whether I created that to have that for myself. I wanted to create it for other people. And then I kind of got it as a byproduct, which is great. You know, we all do well when we all do well. And again, mm -hmm. that's a a really common thread in one of our core values as a business. I'm going to ask you what I think is a common limiting belief based off this mentality, because I'm curious to hear how you handle this challenge. But just in the concept of taking space, the the yang to that ying is whether or not there's enough space to go around. So mm -hmm. is there a effort to create more space so that there is to occupy or is it about identifying that the space has always been there so how do you address limiting a belief like that and just giving people the sense that there is room for them to act in the way that you're encouraging them to act i think there's space for both ways of thinking um, so when I first started out, I kind of put my flag in the floor and said, right, I'm a motivated about five years ago, right, I'm a motivational speaker now, I'm going to do speaking, I'm going to motivate people and inspire people, I had these systems that I wanted to share. And just by telling people that I was a motivational speaker did not create me the opportunities because the market's already quite saturated, right? And so what I did was instead of being weighted to be invited to the table, I went and created my own table. I created an event. It was called Be Inspired. It's now called the Big Festoon. It's one of the fastest growing UK events for personal development and business development centered in kindness and inclusivity. And because that's grown and because I created traction in that way for myself with my own table, that started to get me invites. People were looking over at my dinner party going, oh, she sounds like she throws a good party. Maybe she should come to ours as well. And in creating that, instead of being expected to be invited, actually, I started to get invited because I was having my own party. I was like saying, look, things can be different and started to invite other people to my party, other event producers, other corporate entities to show them that actually here's, here's a space where it could be a bit different. Do you fancy having a conversation, a safe conversation about what that could look like for you? And that's how that sort of lit the blue touch paper of me getting more and more gigs. And that's one of the things that I love to teach to my clients who and my audience, just my, my community in general. Don't wait. Don't wait to be asked because you could be knocking on the door and the door might be shut. Find a window, go and make a table, you know, go and get your hammer and nails out, go and find some wood, come and invite people to your table, go and have conversations. And you'll find that actually, because so few people have the stones to go out and do that, people are sat there thinking, oh, you know, what? I'm never gonna be invited anyway. And so mm. few people have the courage to go out and ask. Again, it comes back to this closed mouths don't get fed. They don't do it. And then there's a whole bunch of people sat there not doing it. So the few people that do do it then get the opportunities. Be one of those people. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've noticed somewhat of a polarizing effect 
um, and and there is good and there is a bad to this. So the bad side of it is that it's it's hard to completely shut out the news and not be aware of the like 12 wars that are being waged right now and there's yeah. a lot of darkness in the world and so i think if people are predisposed to the defeatist attitude there's certainly enough evidence to support that case whereas i i from my personal point of view after talking to 300 people all of whom are <laughs> successful enough to warrant being invited to be a guest on a on a podcast uh, you know as a, as a start of the uh, long list of accolades there's also enough impetus for people to want to succeed as well do you what do you think about that do you feel like that there is more of a polarizing effect where the the negative people are are kind of like spiraling deeper and then the people who um, you know, like you wants to uh, make a difference in the world are finding more reasons to do it. And the sort of the middle ground is 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 dissipating. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100 percent. And that is a task that the media has set themselves. So it would seem to create this polarization. Um, the, the deeper conversation is why would they create polarization? I think it's because it keeps a lot of people very rich. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things like war keep a lot of people very rich. Keeping people invested in war like they would a soap opera keeps a lot of people very rich. And for the people who want to see better, uh, I think when you've overcome a significant amount of adversity, you realise that whilst I can't have a direct effect on the things like war that are happening out there right now, I'm just one person. Where can I do good? Where can I shine my light? Instead of being consumed by darkness, why not head toward that? And it, some, for, for some people, it might seem futile, but why not seek seek the light? And I don't mean to ignore the darkness. I mean, knowing that the darkness is there, but understanding where can I have the most positive impact? Where can I have the most change? Or where can I like create the most change where can I shine the brightest light and for me you know I could get involved in lots and lots and lots of different causes for lots of different reasons spread myself so thin that I won't have any impact on any then choosing the one cause that really means something in my immediate periphery something that I have direct lived experience of I can go and make a change there and at the same time be educated by people who've got lived experience of the other things so for example where wars are going on making sure that I'm being well read and well educated around that and doing and seeking that for myself instead of being fed it by wherever I happen to turn my social media on or turn my TV on with the knowledge that there's a reason why people are telling a certain story through a certain lens. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to get lost in the dark is the first one, very easy and and devastating for so much that's happening. My heart's breaking for so much that's happening. And then I think if go going right back to what can I do? If I can do anything, what can I do? Can I educate on those particular situations? No, I don't know enough about it. So I can get informed about those things. And when people are having conversations that may be incorrect, educate accordingly if I'm if I'm able to. Or I can, or and, because you can do both, get myself educated in those fields, but then look at where I can shine a light and really go hammer and tongs at shining my light there and making sure that if I can leave the world a little bit better than I found it, then that's where I can do it. Then either you know, sitting there mm -hmm. and doing nothing about any of it or allowing myself to just be given one side of information and allowing myself to get in a dark hole. Mm -hmm. Listening to what you're saying, I'm reminded of a uh, interview that I had seen. This was, uh, well, it was a TikTok clip, but it was probably from a, a TV show or a web series. And there was a gentleman who, as a, as a means of, of saving money, for traveling he pays attention to the news and he finds out when a country is going through some difficult times or if there's been an attack and then he books a flight and he actually takes his vacation there because there's usually a lot of discounts in the services there because people are prone to uh, avoid a place like that mm -hmm. and at first I saw that and I laughed because it's a very like that's know, wild, it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I can't quite think of the the word that I want to use. I was about to say audacious. And I'm like, okay, well, she said it earlier. That's me just borrowing her word. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't have the capital on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just you know I just don't want to um, seem like I'm just like you know copying pasting. Um, um, what was it? <laughs> recency bias yeah that was it that was what I was worried about but I, I thought about it a little bit more after what you're describing and I thought you know what he what he's doing is really humanizing that country because it's saying like a country is not just um, uh, bleak there are people there who are trying to make a good living and there are people yeah. who are kind and gracious all over the world so for him to say I'm going to go there at their darkest and I'm going to su support them 
that was something that not a lot of people do. And, you know, and respectfully, it's a brave uh, act in, in his regard, too, because, well, obviously something's uh, something's up with that. But I didn't necessarily have a question for that. I just thought that was an interesting observation. It's a really interesting insight. Absolutely. You know, people there are people in this world that run toward the fire and people that run away from it, you know, and I tend to be somebody who runs towards the fire, but I'm just choosing the fires so as mm -hmm. not to spread myself so thin these mm -hmm. days. Now, I, I did have another Harry Potter question for you. <laughs> Actually, no, there, there's two, but one of them, well, trust me, you'll 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 know which one this is going to be. It's it's uh, the fun one of the three. I'm ready. But so, based off what you you told me, it wasn't necessarily like in in the Wizarding world where the two worlds are um, deliberately disconnected from one another, and the only reason why there was a connection is because dark forces are are marching and invading in the mugger world but what i wanted to ask about was because as harry gets into the wizarding world although he meets people who, who who love him who are his friends and they become his family there was also intense violent prejudice in that world because of the the history there so in in your parallel in the wizarding world did were there prejudices were there limiting uh, people were there people who limited you in ways that you had to overcome yeah my accent's one of them okay so okay. when i'm on podcasts particularly when i'm on podcasts that i know were um a moving sort of in an international more international circles my accent tends to be softer um there's a comedian over here in the uk called peter k mm -hmm. and he's He's really funny because he's a great observer, as many comedians are, great observers. And he speaks to a lot of northern humour. So northern humour in the in the UK is is very warm um, and very observational, very matter of fact. And there is a, a potential when you go elsewhere in the UK that you don't sound intelligent. When actually some of the most intelligent people, you know, I know are, are northern and, and what have you. But... The, the more kind of northern you sound or the more heavily accented that you are, especially when you move sort of further south, it's considered that you're not as well learned or indeed as well traveled or indeed as well socialized, I guess, mm -hmm. as, as say somebody who works and has grown up in the city, who has been, you know, who has, you know, generational wealth, for example. We have different experiences for sure. And there's more generational wealth sort of below the Watford gap, so to speak, which is a, a like a, a, a dividing line, an invisible dividing line between the North and the South. They say anywhere above the Northern, uh, anywhere above the Watford gaps, the North, and that's two thirds of the North. Uh, so a, a misconception, I guess, is often centered around when I tell people where I'm from, the fact that I haven't been to university, um, the fact that not so much now, because I have a degree of success behind me to be able to say, you know, well, you know, my business turns over this amount of money or I have this kind of client or I work with this celebrity or that or the other. They can see that I've actually come through the other side of that. But right at the very beginning, it was very easy to be dismissed mm -hmm. as somebody from the north who was just having a crack at, uh, you know, having a bash at the uh, at the coaching world. And, and you know, what has she got to say? And some of that was my limiting beliefs as well. Like, who am I? That inherent imposter syndrome and what hap what would happen is that energetically I would enter into a space like that feel like I was going to get found out but just let myself be found out <laughs> almost not that there was anything to find out you know I'm incredibly intelligent really articulate I'm a savvy business mind I'm an incredible coach and all of these things but because of the way that I speak um because of my accent because of my past, you know, tell people before, you know, I've, I've been homeless, and, you know, I've been an addict, I've been this and I've been that and I've been the other. At the beginning, that would evoke questions or invoke questions that might have questioned my ability to deliver. And then my job was just then to deliver and deliver and deliver and deliver until there's no more questions left to ask. Like, mm -hmm. what's she doing? She's, she's absolutely smashing up the field. She's creating one of the fastest growing events here in the UK and eventually globally. And I'm going to keep doing that. Um, so yeah, I'm running, a, I run a little bit on spite where that's concerned sometimes. Just, I'm going to do well, because not, not because of it. I'm going to do well, despite it. Like, look, yeah. I'm going to do well because I'm Northern. I'm going to do well because I've got grit, because I've experienced trauma. I'm going to do all these things. <laughs> I've, I'm not sure exactly when I've picked up on this, but I did start to notice a slight uptick in the reverse where 
those who ha- have been college educated or university educated have actually experienced the Rome form of prejudice because while they're certainly book read, what they lack is the real world experience and being able to parlay their education into something that contributes to the wider system. So what's what's the the stereotype of oh someone who gets a degree in philosophy, your career your career track is to then teach philosophy. What you know, wait, there's only so many philosophy jobs, so everybody else is just working in a coffee shop until such time. Right. And um, uh, South Park just released a like a a, a one off oh, episode of um, well, they call it Into the Panderverse, but the B plot, all of the all of like the 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 wasp characters, like uh, uh, Stan's dad. They've all lost the ability to do the basic things like fix their oven or or fix their toilet or the sink or or e- electricians work or carpentry. So meanwhile, the handyman who comes across as you know someone um, low education, low status, he is now like jam packed with work. And so by the end of the episode, he's him and the other handyman are in space and they're having like shootouts in in their spaceships <laughs> because they're the only ones who are actually producing value. So to to me, there is a I mean, I guess the prejudice really can go both ways. Is that sure you can be educated, but just the intelligence is not one thing in the same way. um, Beauty is not one thing there. There is intelligence, there's wit, there's wisdom. So there's all sorts of ways that intelligence can manifest. And frankly, um, the post-educary secondary education system does not lend itself to a lot of those manifestations. It doesn't lend itself to the speed at which we move as well. So if you think yeah. right now, especially because technology and AI and everything is happening so, 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 so fast, the years that you spend in education are years that are spent outside of that really fast moving, like by the, if you're reading retrospectively, lots of people's different theses on things and lots of people's different thoughts on things. And actually out in the real world, this is happening and now, this is happening and now, this is happening. You are not equipped with the tenacity, I guess, and the flexibility that you need to keep up. So often you get a lot of college kids that are coming out, university kids that are coming out, that are almost shell-shocked at how fast it moves when they get out. They're like, oh, it's not... It's, it's not as slow as it's happened before. Well, no, and it's only mm-hmm. getting quicker. And I think that, I mean, particularly the education system needs to recognize that actually and bring a little bit more of that in the core skill sets, the resilient skill sets, uh, the tenacious skill sets, if that even can be taught, looking at ways to be flexible and to be thinking on your feet. That agility is absolutely necessary when you come out of education. And you're absolutely right that the prejudice can work in in the opposite direction. If I think about the way that I recruit now and I recruit into my team, once upon a time, a business like mine would have looked for, we have GCSEs here in the UK, A star to C grades. We look for, um, you know, have you got a degree in a certain thing or have you learned about marketing, for example? And I'm in a position as an employer now where I'm like, don't tell me you're funny, make me laugh. Show me you Mm -hmm. can do the job. I'm here. Like, you don't even have to show me your paper. Unless you're a brain surgeon and you've got to be my brain surgeon, then I want to see your certificate. But actually, when it comes to, I work in the social media space, but predominantly in terms of my marketing, show me that you're a great marketer. Show me that you've got great ideas. Show me that you're creative. We can attach skills on. We can send you on training courses to do the semantics, but show me how flexible and agile you are. And people are more and more being recruited against those assets and those capabilities now more so than ever than they are oh i need a degree in order to work in business now you don't need a degree to work in business i work in business um so yeah fascinating fascinating how the two when i first started i think that was the beginning of that paradigm shift i guess Mm -hmm. of where your capabilities are seem deemed more of an asset in certain circles i think in older establishments definitely not Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I've mentioned this maybe once or twice on the program. So for my consistent listeners, um, sorry. But mm-hmm. when I was working on a Web3 podcast, the concept of the metaverse obviously was a very popular subject. And probably the most significant takeaway that I got from that project is how um, metaverse, while at the moment is just used for fun, it will actually be a useful and perhaps even essential tool for for work and the reason why is because as you're saying um things are changing so rapidly we're not going to have the luxury to crystallize ideas the same way that we used to someone who just goes to a factory and pulls a lever for 40 years has a pretty crystal crystal clear idea of what work is going to be like so in using the 
advancements of say virtual reality and being able to display things in 3d especially in like in the architecture space for instance being able to display the buildings in 3d being able to convey information using different uh, forms of presenting data this is actually going to be an essential tool to help retain that plasticity that people are going to need in order to continue doing work and i mean just one takeaway for the audience is look into daos digit um decentralized autonomous organizations. These are basically projects that it's a company that could last a week because once it's got a goal, you do the goal and then you move on. So I, I anticipate that within the next couple of generations, honestly, work is going to change on a day-to-day -day basis at this point. And the technology has to be there to keep things interesting and, and lively and fun. Otherwise, mm -hmm. um, people are not going to be able to keep up with the demand. Yeah, and you know, there's this... AI is a real, real thing. It's a real threat and a real help in both yep. in both instances. And I was uh, reading a book by Mo Gordak called Scary Smart. I think it's called Scary Smart. Um, talking about almost like the five horsemen of the apocalypse where AI is concerned, but also the things that we can do in order to train AI now, which is when it needs to happen, how, as it becomes more and more sentient, which it is becoming, how we can train in order to complement and for us to properly coexist. And the more people that understand that we have to understand technology, we've got to in order to keep up, we've got to understand how this works instead of just being sort of passably more and more absorbed into it, more and more brought into our devices, however those devices look, to actually be able to take a step back and, and think, well, what's my part in this? Where do I remain autonomous? Where do I, you know, how do I still get connection how can I still be healthy throughout all of this and in eventing for me I've got to think how does this work for eventing how does this work for ev the events that I run because that's going to be real I'm growing my event to a 10,000 delegate event it looks very different now to how it will do in 10 years time and technology is going to play a massive part in that and credit where it's due too for the storytellers and artists who have created <laughs> stuff like even like the terminator for instance you know obviously it comes out as an action movie that we're supposed to enjoy but it imparts a lesson which is we have to be on top of the advancements of technology every step of the way otherwise it will most likely get out of hand yeah and we're all interlinked we're all plugged into it we're all feeding this sentient algorithm now so by what we watch and what we consume we're being shown more of what we consume so we need to be now more than ever more intentional about what we're consuming. So my job as a content creator, as as is yours in this instance, right, is to create content that is gonna keep people engaged in a healthy way, that is gonna help spark healthy debate, help move us forward as humanity. That's a big, big responsibility now that our content creators have. Otherwise, we're gonna fall into a trap of mindless scrolling, being shown lovely cat pictures, we're on the dopamine, serotonin yep. hit all yep. the time, all the time. We have to wake up to that in order for us to, to keep moving forward. Otherwise, because we're so plugged into it all now, we're just gonna end up being consumed. That's quite a scary thought. I didn't think we was gonna get onto uh, the demise of humanity, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a real thing. Yeah, that, I, I, I have a reputation for taking things in, uh, in unusual directions, but I, I like to think of it as like prospecting for ideas, right? For uh, sure. So I'm going to make one last point about AI, and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll close the lid on that. But if I had to create a word that's both exciting and scary, it would be like X scares or scare sites me is mm -hmm. the fact that there's over like a, th what, like a thousand hours worth of me on the internet at this point and so if an ai wanted to come along one day and reconstruct me along after i'm i've gone there is enough information there to make a pretty accurate depiction of who i am and, and what i did yeah. and so while i don't think i can particularly stop that from happening what i can do is just focus on being as authentic as i am so that my reconstruction is how i've perceived myself uh, on my own Absolutely. And the same, like, I'd like to think that what we're, you know, we're putting out, you know, being aligned humans in this space right now, that the, the same for me is that I'm not putting out anything that's damaging. I'm not putting out anything that is inherently, you know, um, you know ambiguous you know I'm, we're good people trying to do good things, trying to have good conversations. And if that's if that's going to be the recreation of me in years to come, then I'm here for it. So be it. That scare sights me too. <laughs> okay, so the other Harry Potter question for you. Um, what house were you sorted into and what house did you think you'd be sorted into? I thought I'd be Gryffindor, but I'm Slytherin. 
Oh, ah, interesting. <laughs> See, I was a I was a tie between Ravenclaw or Slytherin. You're so Ravenclaw. You are so Ravenclaw. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Gryffindor. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I see it. I see it. And then, you know, that's how how such a part of 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 life. You know, these these fiction books get to be right. So you think, oh, you you know, you're so. I look at my daughter. In fact, no, my eldest son wants to be Gryffindor so bad. And he's just, he's a Hufflepuff. He's a lover. Mm. He's not a fighter. He feels things really hard. And trying to say to him over the years, like, mate, you, dude, I love you. And you love hard. Like, you're a Hufflepuff. He's like, I'm not. I'm a Gryffindor, mum. And people will say, well, you know, I'm a Slytherin. And uh, people go, oh, are you? Does that mean that you're really conniving? No, I'm just, I'm really ambitious. I'm really intelligent. And I like to make things happen. I don't see myself as being particularly brave like a Gryffindor or particularly sort of detail centric. And interestingly, this is something that I teach for, with, with my clients in the speaking space, that when you're considering communication, most psychological profiling falls onto a quadrant, right? Okay. Results driven people, ideas driven people, people driven people and details driven people. So if we think about that, that's a very similar situation than the houses being sorted into that i'm an ideas person uh, you know I, from an ideas perspective but now i'm in business i'm very results driven now that is that's a, a different hat that i put on in different situations and i think that even though you can identify a certain way you'll lean a certain way you can choose depending on the situation that you're in to communicate in a way that's going to speak to the people in the room but as long as you're like communicating with the communicate the idea then the results then you're going to pick up your results people and your ideas people in the first instance they're the people that are your responders and your reactors and then your processes your details people your people people speak to them next and falling into the harry potter quadrant is kind of how i think about things you know where am i details where are my results you know Ravenclaw's details Hufflepuff is your people and mm -hmm. then between Gryffindor which is actually your idea situation and Slytherin which is your results situation it's funny how um how the author of the books has played into that I get it it's Jungian isn't it that that kind of quadrant of mm -hmm. of where people sit and and this it takes me to um one of well there's like a dozen other things that I've wanted to ask but um the idea of encouraging people and encouraging people to speak on stage and I could say this is a limiting belief but I don't really feel that way I just feel like this is a, a challenge that is unique to different people to different levels mm -hmm. so I think some people are are, are natural um, speakers I, I I pick up on your energy and I, and I think you, you obviously be very natural on stage you're you've been a performer basically your whole life um, with some feedback, positive feedback that really resonated with me that I got years ago was they really appreciated that my energy was more calm and more stoic. And I'm like, oh, I love that yes. word. So what are some of the more challenging energy profiles that maybe you've worked with and how you help them find a unique way to um, command the stage when maybe it's not as obvious how they would do it? I think it's getting the person to accept their energy profile. I think in the first instance that confidence and we're looking at confidence being an engaging thing right so and all confidence is is knowing your job as a speaker is to generate safety with the audience is to generate you know we can utilize tools like tension and things like that for sure and whether it's the bubbly tigger like energy that i have that isn't for everybody and when people are programming um events they need to consider this that they need stoic speakers they need energy injectors it, all of it adds to the ebb and flow and some of the most compelling conversations i've had is when people have come to me and said ah i'm an introvert danny it means that i'm not going to be you know a great speaker because they've seen me and appreciated the quality of speaking i do and think they've got to emulate that the task i have is to magnify everything that is great about them not apply everything that is great about me to that person so that's the task in the first instance, because once they understand that what they have and who they are, you know, and our contrasting energies, I think I'm going to listen back to it. I can't wait to listen to this conversation. It's a it's a joy to listen to, because if we were going at it like two tiggers, mm -hmm. the quality of our conversation wouldn't be the same. The quality of the information that we're conveying between the two of us isn't the same and it wouldn't have the same impact. So accepting 
your energy style in the first instance is the first step towards becoming compelling. And then you can attach any kind of sort of presentation tips and tricks to yourself, be it a way that you stand, a pace that you move. If you think, uh, someone said to me, uh, one of my friends, Nick James actually said to me, heroes move slow. And I'm like, I am not moving slow anywhere, friend, but it's great to share with my most stoic, a uh, beautiful word, by the way, um, my I most agree. stoic, more, more calm um, speakers, my more um, sort of steadier way in terms of energy. People need that. You know, if, especially if you're conveying information, they need to know they've got a strong, solid pair of hands. That grounded masculine energy is great for conveying information. So knowing that's a superpower and knowing heroes move slow is something that, you know, if you've got that more grounded energy that you can really hold on to think, I'm, I'm a hero in this situation, you know, and, and, and shine that from the inside out. I, I, I just wanted to um, unpack the, the heroes move slow just a little bit because I... I, I'm just thinking of like all of the heroic figures that have come to my mind. Superman, first responders. I I'm not exactly seeing what is the the correlation between that. So like I don't know. Is there any heroic figures in media that the cin- resonate the with cinema, it? The cinema photographers. What the cinematographers do is when they are doing their most important thing, they will play that stuff in slow motion. So when the most important things happening, that's when they slow stuff down. Okay, like when the most okay. impactful things are going, that's when you're going to see the most of the hero. Yes, for the exciting um, like action scenes, you've got a lot happening. But actually, in the moment, the hero moves slow and probably moves the slowest. He's dodging the bullet like Neo in the Matrix, for example. Um, okay. Even in the even in the Avengers or even something like Deadpool, the whole opening sequence is done entirely in slow motion. But what you get to do is you get to hear the thoughts of Deadpool as he's going through this really intense action scene. The whole thing's done in slow motion. So it's the way that the information is conveyed to us in terms of, you know, I move quite quick. I'm still a hero, but it's that concept that things slow down when the impactful stuff's really happening. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. And it actually um, created a connection in my mind because I was just thinking about how um, when a baseball player, for instance, steps up to, to the to the plate and is ready to take a swing, um, apparently they can control their breath. And so they can actually perceive time just slow enough that they can respond to the baseball where any average person would end up with a concussion. So that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, and that's yeah. the, so when you're, when you're stepping up to the bat or when you're stepping up to the stage, you're firing off cortisol and adrenaline and everything happens quicker. A lot of people, you know, report after having been speaking on the stage, that happened really quick. And actually, um, and Brendan Burchard talks about this is the slowing of time by allowing yourself to be grounded and centered and breathe is, is the biggest piece of feedback I've got for most of my speakers. Like you can afford to slow down there and actually it allows you to check the temperature of the room, check the temperature of yourself. How am I doing? How is the audience responding? Instead of trying to go at it like a, a steam train, mm-hmm. pulling back, slowing down, checking the pace, breathing, and it allows you to perceive things better as well. You're dead right. You're dead right. Mm-hmm. We, um, we're getting pretty close to the hour mark, so we're getting pretty close to uh, wrapping this conversation up. Um, at, at this point, the, the last questions are the traditional Impactful Coaching Podcast, like rapid fire, lightning round kind of questions. So the, the first one for you is, what, what challenges is your platform facing at the moment? And I, I typically frame this as a technical question to the point where like, well, we're, we're trying to get uh, our, our video content more reach, our social media more reach, ranking higher on, on Google or whatever it is that you, you feel like are the, the main challenges that your platform is facing at the moment. So I think that the landscaping and the way in which people are launching their products and services is changing. I think during lockdown, there was very much like a live launch situation. So you'd, you know, have people uh, enter into like a marketing funnel, for example, get people to a webinar, you'd sell to them as part of that webinar. And at the end of it, you'd have like a, a, a an open cart situation. And I think that that's been, that's been going on for so long now and people are being much more wise to make than to make sort of impulse buys in the moment and i think that there is a, a necessity for more open connection um for people so actually thinking about how you directly connect with your audience is super important now more than it is than it ever has been before i think that yes whilst there's lots of space for automation 
I think we all need to take a little step back and think about how are we really genuinely communicating with those that are around us um, how are we create genuine connections instead of hyping someone up to the point where they just can't wait to buy from you it's so unethical actually does this person need your goods and service yes okay how are you going to help them and what's the, going to be the benefit and the magic of working with you and have a relationship with that person now i know that's not very traditional in terms of people want to grow massive coaching businesses and have huge automations and lots of numbers but the quality of our coaching relationships needs to get better because people are engaging in programs and not engaging with programs they're buying and they're not doing it um, which is, I don't want that. I don't want to spend all my time creating incredible programs and online learning facilities and people not engaging with it because they've impulse books. They've been chucked into a funnel somewhere. So for me, I'm utilizing, yes, some degree of automation, but also in-person events and pulling. I want people to come to my events and come and connect with each other and do business together that way. So that's one thing. And then the other is people are trying to hack the algorithm all the time. And I think the consistent the consistent thing that you need to remember is the quality of the content you create is paramount. Help your audience, show up for your audience, allow them to peek behind the curtain, be real with them. And trying to show up super, super slick is alienating because the, the fallacy of perfection is a fallacy. So, so many people, particularly in the, in the coaching industry, show up super slick, super perfect, super quaffed, you know, and actually that's removing them further and further. Yes, it's aspirational, don't get me wrong, but it's removing themselves further and further and further and further away than the people that they're trying to help. So understanding that, that the content that you create and the, and the marketing strategies that you do need to be, yes, a mix of this professional stuff, but they need to see the real person now more than ever. How are you breaking that fourth wall with your audience and being creative about doing that, I think is both the challenge and the solution. I 99% I agree, but the 1% that I, I don't is because I p put a fair amount of energy into my quaff. But you know what it is? It's like, it's either I I, I, I fix it and, it and it looks good or I don't touch it and it looks like a disaster. And it's like the, <laughs> the middle ground isn't there. So it's almost like um, feeling that need to be as, as slick and as poison as professional, um, sorry, like pseudo professional as possible. Yeah. At, mm -hmm. as the only option otherwise it looks you know messy and jumbled and amateurish and unreliable 100 percent. and i think that the best way to do that is to is to consider what's the alternative so you so you've got that situation and you can make that as perfect as perfect where can you be imperfect where can you let the mask slip a little bit and not in and not in your setup and not in where you know where you would expect to be professional where you'd expect it to be polished but where is the space within your marketing within your you know within your socials where you can just show yourself a little bit i've just posted today when we're recording this just before a picture of me i've got barely any makeup on with my hood up saying you know what i just want it to be winter now right it's winter we're all going to snuggle and eat food there's no value in the content. I'm not telling anybody anything. I'm just showing them a little bit of myself. Is it perfectly curated? No. Is the pixel size on the picture good? No. Is the font in the right place? No. But it gives people a little bit of a, the mask is down a little bit. I can see Danny a little bit more. Where is the space in that? So yes, of course, make things professional. Make sure that your, you know, your automations work well. Make sure that you've got slick stuff to put out there. But where is where is the you in it? Where is the you, and where can we feel? I don't. Sounds ruder than I intended. Where can we feel you in all of this? <laughs> um, the other uh, uh, part of the the wrap up question sort of ties into all of this. But if you had to um, give yourself like a five year trajectory for it, what would you say are the significant milestones that you want to see accomplished in five years? So for me, there's two huge milestones. Well, three actually. So the first is the big one is to grow the event that we have here in the UK now, to growing that to a 10,000 delegate event and have it and impacting more lives as a result of that and then taking the event international. So we're in talks with moving the big festoon to, well, not moving it, but having a branch of it in LA, in Sydney and chipping away at bringing that community to the international stage and not just to the UK stage because uh, mm -hmm. already we work we work online with people that are abroad people who are abroad that come here to to attend the events but we want to kind of take the event out to other people and create that big sort of tsunami of safe spaces to have conversations that matter so that's the big one and then the incremental goals will be to go from like a 2000 delegate event to 5000 5000 to 10 
and we're making a documentary as we do it. So one of the things that my community and I have laughed about and have laughed about for years is I have no scruples about saying that it doesn't it doesn't serve me not to be famous, right? So I want to be famous, but I don't want to be famous because I want to be famous. I want to be mm -hmm. famous because I want more people to understand that we all do well when we all do well, that we need to have conversations that are solution centered and not us being right to each other. So finding platforms for me to enter into, to bring my community to is one of the, one of the goals, which is more difficult to quantify, but we're making a documentary on our road to 10 K. And then the other the third is to impact the lives of 10,000 people who've experienced domestic abuse through the flying away foundation and help build 10,000 businesses in the next five years. Amazing. Um, I I think that I think that was more or less everything that I wanted to ask for today. You know, it's kind of a challenge because the 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 best speakers are the ones who are like answering all the questions that I have written down, and I go, <laughs> oh boy, okay. <laughs> um, but that is everything that we've got for today. So, um, Danny, I I can't thank you enough for your time. If you did have any other like points, observations, or just anything else that's kind of like floating in your mind right now as a result of this conversation, I would be happy to let you have the floor for a minute or two, just to make sure. And then otherwise let the audience know how they can reach out and learn a little bit more about you. Well, first of all, thank you, Joseph, for having me. It's been a joy to speak to you and it's been a joy to explore these different thoughts and these different these different ways of thinking in, in, in ways that I don't normally. So thank you for holding the space to, to do that and for us to do that together today. Um, there's a, there's a, a system that I share and something that uh, I share with all of my community. I'd love to share it with yours as well. And it's the concept of showing up, wising up and rising up. It sounds quite glib, but the, the, the reason why cliches are cliches are because they are well-worn and, and for the most part they work. And one of the, the systems that I use to to help move things forward all the time is something I find really helpful. So the concept of showing up, rising up and rising up is this, is to understand where it is that you're going. And then it's a mathematical, it's a mathematical equation from there. You need to learn what you need to learn. You need to wise up. You need to engage in podcasts like this in order to broaden the way that you think about the world instead of just thinking about the way in which you've always thought about them. Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always had. Wise up. So rising up, map out those plans, map out those goals, understand who you want to help, why, where you want to do it and all of that. Then you need to learn your craft so hard and so well that you become the expert in your field. And then the bit that's often missing from the equation is showing up. How are you going to show up today? And I'm so, so grateful that we got to show up for each other today, Joseph. Thank you. Well, same to you as well. Um, every Alluding to what we had said earlier about how can we not be in a good mood? How do we, because the, the, the work that we get to do. And so for me to be able to make this as part of my, my career, to connect with people, learn something, share something, and to have a conversation such as this really is an honor and a privilege. So um, to everybody involved who makes this possible, including Zoom, I forgot about you, Zoom. Um, one more, more, more good thank you for the road. Um, but that is it. It has been the Impactful Coaching Podcast. To everybody who has any feedback, you can always, always, always email Joseph, that's J-O-S-E-P-H, at impactfulcoachingpodcast.com. The rest of it is spelled exactly the way you can expect. And it is our endeavor to ensure that in whatever way you are helping others, we want to make sure that you are impactful while you're at it. <laughs>